one of the Army's best kept secrets was that there was a black fighter group. The Army wasn't publicizing because they said it was that first authorization of the squadron, the 99th Pursuit Squadron, they expected it to fail. In 1939, the Nazis plunged Europe into turmoil when they invaded Poland, kicking off the Second World War. In a short time, the German war machine with its powerful Luftwaffe overran country after country. The most horrific war in human history soon engulfed the whole world. Preparing for the worst, the U.S. Army Air Corps started to recruit more pilots, massively ramping up training programs. Eager to serve their country, many young black men volunteered with the Army Air Corps. The officer in charge told me, he said, well, we don't have any colored in the military in the Air Corps. There are other places for you, and we will not have any. The basis for their refusal was a staff report which had determined I use that word euphemistically, that the colored troops did not have the capability, the intelligence, the courage, or even the coordination to fly fighter aircraft. It's a 68-page report on the American Negro soldier during World War One. It's a 68-page report on garbage. So we were anxious to prove, to disprove all that nonsense for yourself and, and, and for the race. The military was not alone in its systematic discrimination against black Americans. Across the country, African Americans were routinely treated as second-class citizens. Prejudice cut into all aspects of life. In many states, racial segregation was enforced through Jim Crow laws. Civil rights activists such as A. Philip Randolph and Judge William Hastings, together with the NAACP and the black press, advocated for full and equal inclusion of African Americans in the war effort. Leading the charge, the Pittsburgh Courier, a prominent black newspaper called out the War Department for not training black pilots. With pressure mounting on President Franklin D. Roosevelt, the War Department eventually gave in. They had a big debate going on. They finally decided that, yes, we will train a squadron. The first class consisted of uh, 13, 12 students and one military officer, who was then Captain Davis, who later uh, became the commander. Captain Benjamin O. Davis Jr. was thrilled to be one of the first African Americans to begin military pilot training. A few years earlier, he graduated from the military academy at West Point. At that time, he applied for pilot training, but was rejected because of the color of his skin. Now he finally got his chance. He would not only become a very accomplished combat pilot himself, but he would also be instrumental for the success of the new unit. The War Department decided to build a new air base for African Americans in Tuskegee, Alabama, a town in the segregated South. With this separate air base, the War Department avoided integrating any existing Army Air Corps base. The location also presented several challenges for the newly arrived cadets. Well, that was a, quite an experience to go south, of course. Uh, on the train leaving uh, uh, Illinois uh, and across the Mason-Dixon line, we had to go to a special car that kept races separated. Fortunately, in the training program, we had a number of cadets who were from the South and familiar, and they kept those of us from the North. They let us know where not to go buy gasoline or that type of thing to keep us out of trouble. 
the Tuskegee Institute carried out the first phase of military flight training, including classes and variety of disciplines such as engine mechanics, navigation, and the physics of flight. At Moton Field, just a few miles outside of Tuskegee, the cadets received hands-on flight training and began their journey to become pilots. He had a two-seated airplane. The instructor was up front, the student was in the back. The instructor does things, and you try to follow him on the controls. After you tried enough stuff, he says, I'm leaving, you take it. <laughs> so you have your solo, your first solo. After completing primary flight training, cadets moved to the newly constructed Tuskegee Army Airfield, north of town for advanced instruction. When I got to Tuskegee and I saw all these young cadets, oh my, I said, this is the place I want to be. Nothing like Tuskegee Army Air Force Base. In Europe, Countless lives were lost on and off the battlefield. The Nazis persecuted anyone who they deemed inferior to the master race. However, it was the flagrant attack on Pearl Harbor, half a world away, that brought the U.S. firmly into the war and prompted millions of young men to volunteer for the armed services. When I got the notice to go to Tuskegee Army Airfield as a cadet, I was eager to go, dropped all things, and drove to Tuskegee Army Airfield. Soon, the 99th Fighter Squadron was joined by a full fighter group, the 332nd Fighter Group, for training at the airbase. Besides pilots, about 16,000 men and women trained or worked in connection with the program as ground crews, airplane mechanics, crew chiefs, armorers, and meteorologists, but also clerks, military surgeons, and nurses. All of them, including the white personnel, are nowadays known as Tuskegee Airmen. With the eyes of the War Department and the entire nation on them, the Tuskegee Airmen understood the responsibility that rested on their shoulders. It had come to the realization that, uh, that it would not come easy, that we would have to be almost twice as good as the other people if we were to succeed. White pilots were rushed overseas as soon as possible, but due to persistent doubt in the War Department, none of the Tuskegee Airmen were deployed by the end of 1942. Finally, in April 1943, the 99th Fighter Squadron left Camp Shanks in New York with Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Davis in command. They were bound for North Africa. And they were attached to the 33rd Group. And that commander didn't want, well actually, none of the commanders wanted a color squadron. The 99th Fighter Squadron flew their first missions over the Italian islands of Pantelleria and Sicily. They soon scored their first aerial victory. However, this was far from smooth sailing. Their fighter group commander, Colonel Mamier, called the combat performance of the 99th substandard in his report. This report shortly after reached the top echelons of the War Department. Again, the ability of African Americans to be fighter pilots was under question by the white establishment. Well, Colonel Davis was called back to the States to testify. Colonel Davis fought for the 99th to stay in combat and the 332nd to keep training. He succeeded. And at the beginning of 1944, three more squadrons of Tuskegee Airmen deployed for Italy. In the spring of 1944, the Tuskegee Airmen took on their most important mission yet. 
they were stationed near the small Italian village of Ramatelli. From there, they flew escorts for bomber squadrons that targeted oil refineries and factories in German territory. The goal was to grind the German war industry to a stop. We thought we had enough guns on our B-17s and B-24s to protect them from the German Air Force. That wasn't the case sometime. Half the squadron was lost. But for every plane loss, that's 10 American lives. Half of our missions were strafing. Down on coming close to the ground and strafing trains, trucks, tanks, whatever, buildings. Half of the missions were high level where we escorted the bombers from Italy to Germany. Not long after Tuskegee Airmen arrived in Ramatelli, they received newer and faster P-51 Mustang aircrafts. Until the P-51 arrived over there, the fighters couldn't go all the way to the target with the bombers, but the 51 had the range that it could all the way to the target and bring them back. Mustang did what you wanted it to do unconsciously. It's just like sitting in a seat and beautifully maneuverable. It was out of this world. It's powerful and responsive. It's a joy. The tails of the P-51s were painted bright red so the bomber crews knew they were friendly fighters. Colonel Davis said, don't go chasing people, you stay with the bombers. Uh, you bring 10 men on that bomber, and they'll get back home again. So. Before long, the Red Tails were known for losing fewer bomber crews than other fighter groups. For that reason, bomber squadron specifically requested to be escorted by them. We had no idea that the Red Tails, who had given us the finest escort, were black pilots. Colonel Davis even named his plane by request. That was very popular at that time. Uh, I ended up, uh, my wife's name was Kitten, so I put Kitten on mine. But I also liked that because I said my crew chief kept that engine purring like a kitten, so <laughs> keep it there. <laughs> Although the German Luftwaffe was already on the decline by 1944, German fighter planes still presented a substantial threat. So I shot down uh, two uh, aircraft. Uh, they were FW-190, Focke-Wulf-190, and a third one I was given credit for. And, uh, uh, he was uh, on my tail, and uh, uh, he had, had me in his sights there. Then I saw these traces come around me, and I thought, sure, I was going to get uh, knocked down and hit by that one that was behind me. But what had happened there is, I believe he over-controlled, and he uh, crashed into the ground, and uh, I was given uh, credit for that as uh, three aircraft. That happened. That was our biggest day. Over a two-day period, uh, we got 25 victories. German fighter planes paired with ground-based German anti-aircraft guns made for a particularly deadly combination. There were seven of us, and uh, of that seven, uh, two were shot down uh, uh, in the dogfight that we were in, and uh, one was shot up badly enough that on the way back home he had to make an emergency landing. Altogether, 81 Tuskegee Airmen were killed in combat or accidents and 30 pilots were captured as prisoners of war. For their excellent performance, the Tuskegee Airmen received numerous combat awards, including the Distinguished Flying Cross, Air Medals, and Distinguished Unit Citations. The war in Europe ended on May 8, 1945, and the Tuskegee Airmen prepared to head home to the United States. That's the thing, overseas, we were segregated over there, we were on a separate base. But uh, coming back at the States, then we realized that segregation is really full force back here. 
You take it and suck it in and survive, realizing that under certain circumstances, you couldn't change it. But there are other things that I did work on and have to change. Even as the Tuskegee Airmen continued to endure injustice and hatred from some of the very countrymen they just risked their lives to defend, major changes were set in motion within the military. President Truman signed the executive order in July of 48, 9981, and he told the Army, Navy, and Air Force to submit their plan for racial segregation. The Air Force separated in 1947 from the Army and was the first arm of the military to integrate. Soon, Tuskegee Airmen served all around the world. But if we had not been as successful as we were, there's no way that Truman would have possibly made that move. In a sense, I'm, I really believe before two wars. One's the war against the Axis and Germans and Japanese, and the other is the war against segregation. Maybe I wouldn't be here without them. That's exactly that. They were trailblazers, because before them, there weren't anybody who looked like them doing the things that they were doing. Those men shaped the world. It's uh, been a blessing for, uh, for me as far as my uh, life is concerned. I wouldn't have changed any of it for, uh, for anything. It's been a, a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful odyssey 